That is awesome. We are in week three of our four-week series of Play to Win. I'm enjoying this series. I hope you are too. But before we dive into today's topic, since my wife was just, that's my wife, by the way, up here, who's just talking about uh, all the stuff going on with Change Your World, let me just pause right now and talk to you a little more about that. I believe that God has called our church to be a catalyst at this point in time to step up to change the world. I believe with all my heart, he's going to use this group of people to make a movement, move forward in our world. And so we, as we move into Change Your World 2.0 in two weeks, we're going to be going on a journey together. We have the opportunity to walk through a blueprint where we understand that although the world is such a big place and it's such a big thing to think of changing the world, we have opportunity and it's not as difficult as you might think it is for us to step through this. So week by week, we're going to go through a process of understanding what it means to change our world together. And if you were a part of that journey a year and a half ago, understand this, although you'll recognize some stuff, there's also new and fresh content and new ideas as we go through this. Uh, my mentor says that nothing is ever good the first time around. And so the second time around, I promise you it'll be even better than what it was before. And you don't want to miss out on that. Having said that, I also want you to make sure that I, that I sear this on your brain. This is not just for us. Look around this room. Everyone look around the room. It's great that you're all here. But turn, turn to the person next to you and say, it's not just about you. Did you, you guys are sounding so kind. No, no, like this. It's not just about you. Come on, come on. Oh, I love it. There are many people who are not here with us today who need to hear this message of Change Your World. As I've gone in the last two years, I, I, my mentor wrote this book called Change Your World, which we use as, as uh, kind of a springboard for this series. When I heard that, that idea, that phrase of change the world, I started talking to people that I know, and I asked them, I said, do you think the world needs to change? And the more I had this conversation, the more I realized no one disagreed with me. Everyone's like, yes, the world needs to change. Feels like we're going to hell in a handbasket sometimes, like all this, the crap that's always going on all the time. You don't, you don't just need to turn the news on for just a minute to go, yep, that's, yeah, we need to change that. But everyone feels like when you talk to them, they're, they're kind of like, but what am I going to do about it? And everyone's just kind of resolved to let the world go on doing its thing without us being a part of change. And I'm telling you, it is time to say no more for us to step up, that we are going to change the world together. But here's the thing. We don't do it with just this group of people in the room. You have to invite people that you know on the journey with you. In fact, in your program, if you guys got your program, pull it out. There's these really cool cards that look like this. Pull them out. What I want you to do is, and, and by the way, we usually do like a business card size thing. We're doing something totally different here. We're giving this a try, but put this in your back pocket, put it in your purse, put it um, in your car so it's easy to, to grab or, in, you know, whatever it works for you. And then when the opportunity arises for you to invite somebody, here's, here's how easy this is. I've done this. You're talking about something that's awful. Everyone's like, oh, did you hear what happened? You know, yeah, I know. It feels like the world needs to change. Do you agree? Yeah, the world needs to change. Huh. You know what? My church is doing this thing called Change Your World. We're, we're, we're saying enough of that. We're stepping up. This is like nothing you've ever experienced before. Have you ever been to church? This is nothing like what you've experienced before. You ought to come check it out. So easy. This, if you have trouble with that, this is an easy invite. And I will, I will share this. I shared this about six weeks ago in a, in a, a message series that we were in that I believe that the gospel of Jesus has the power to transform lives. And if you truly believe that, you will work past any obstacle in your way to make sure that you get the people in your life that you care about the opportunity to hear this message. Because I believe that the power of Jesus will transform people's lives. And I believe that we can change the world. Now, one of the things that we're also doing that will go with this, that releases this week, it'll hit 15,000 households this week, is a mailer that is like this, but a lot larger. You see it there on the screen. If your friends live nearby this area, they will probably get one of these mailers. So when you show them, they're like, oh, hey, I, may have, I think I might have seen something like that in the mail. This is an opportunity for, see, yeah, that's my church. You ought to come check that out. People, you know, getting something like this in the mail, it'll bring some people in, but it's a lot more powerful when someone who you trust says, yeah, that's my church. It's good. You want to check it out. You vouch for it. It's kind of like a five-star Amazon review. You're like, oh, okay, people like this thing. Trust me, if you use these cards in conjunction with this mailer heading this week, you have the opportunity to make a big difference. 
I shared with you last week that we stepped out to, to release this mailer on faith. It's costing us about $6,000, plus we're going to do some, some enhancements here to this space so that when you walk in the week of October 2nd, you're going to be like, huh, is this my church? What happened here? I'm telling you, it's not going to be what you're used to. Be ready for it. But altogether, this is going to cost us around $10,000. And I invited people who wanted to last week. I said until uh, next week, next Sunday, we're going to be allowing people who want to maybe give a one-time gift to help us to change the world together, an opportunity to invest their money in this. And I promise you, this is a, an investment that will return multiple on your investment. My wife and I said, we're going to go first. We did the first thousand. Would you, would you know that since last week that over $6,500 has come in already? That is awesome. <laughs> I want to thank you for your generosity, but I have something really cool to share. We have a, 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 someone in our church, a, a generous family in our church that approached me this week and they said, Mike, we want to do something. We, we want our contribution to change the world to be this, that if anybody gave, gives money today, here on the 18th, if you're watching online, 18th or Monday the 19th, until Monday night, we will, we will match whatever money that is brought in by anybody else. So if you want to see your money go twice as far, this is your opportunity. We have an opportunity on your, pro, in your program in the envelope. You can, you can just fill out the envelope. And I believe there's even a, there may even be a change your world slot on there. I can't remember if there is or not. There's not. So you would just hand write in for other. CYW stands for change your world. And that money will go to helping us uh, launch forward as we move forward on October 2nd. And then anything that comes in today or tomorrow. And by the way, you can get online as well on our website. And there's a change your world category there on our giving page. That money is going to be used to help us advance this mission of changing the world. So I want to make, make, make sure you're aware of that. Now, one last thing, and my wife talked really well. Thank you, babe. You did awesome about change your world groups. But if, if there was something that right now that, that conflicts me, not, that just, uh, as me as a pastor, just causes me to be discouraged and try to figure out how to solve this problem is as I watch people, it's like a sociological experiment that I've seen take place over the last two and a half to three years with COVID. And as I watch people right now, we got out of the habit of being together. We got out of the habit of being together in groups. I was talking to a school teacher this week, and I've talked to several. They say the kids at school, they don't even know how to interact with each other because they were out of the habit for so long that it's just too scary. And chances are you're one of the eight out of 10 people who are introverted, who are just fine not being around other people. You're like, thank you, finally, give me my space. But I got to tell you, that is not the way God designed it. God made us to be together. We are better together. And so we're coming back for Change Your World into community, and we want to invite you to those groups my wife talked about. There's five in the program. We want to invite you to be a part of one of those groups. And if you're like, eh, I'm too busy. You're too busy if you're too busy to go to a group. Trust me, this needs to be a priority. You can't grow in your walk with God and get closer to God, go on that journey with God without people to do life with. It's just too hard to do by yourself. So I want to invite you to be a part of that journey. And if you're like, but Mike, there's five groups and I'm not a cool teenager like Steph, um, which I, I want to join his group too. I look, do you see the picture in the program? He's like jumping in the air. I thought it was cool. Anyways, I, I, none of these groups fit my schedule. You're in luck. You can host one. If you, have, if you have the ability to play a video and you have the ability to cook a batch of brownies, wait, you don't even have to do it well. Because here's the secret. It's not about the taste of the brownies. It's about the smell of the brownies when people come into your house. <laughs> Who cares? Just don't burn them. You cannot burn them. But if you can do those two things, you can, you can be a host for a group. You don't have to know anything special. You don't have to do anything special. We give you the curriculum. There's a video to play and discussion guides. And it's an opportunity for you not even to, to just find people here that you know in this room, but also people that you work with. Maybe do a, a group on your lunch break at work. Maybe do a group with people in your neighborhood who have never heard of or gone to church, never heard of Epic Life Church. It's an opportunity for you to impact more people with the Change Your World message. And so each week we're going to dive into what we talk about on Sunday, but don't have time to dive deep enough in. We're going to dive into that in the groups and go deeper on that same subject each of these eight weeks. So I just want to encourage you to be a part of that. Sign up for a group today. And by the way, the ones we have, there's not a lot of them. They will fill up, I'm telling you. They will fill up. So if you want to get in on one, sign up today. Don't go, well, let me think about it. Get in. You know, it's kind of like when you buy something something and put it on hold and decide later if you're going to keep it or not because they might run out of stock is one of those. Get on the list and then if you decide later it doesn't work or you want to go to a different group, that's fine. But you don't want to miss that. Sign up today. And then if you want to host a group, you want to at least even consider hosting a group, we will give you everything you need to succeed on that. And we encourage you to do that. All right. That was a lot on that. Now we're going to jump into today's topic on play to win. And today we're going to talk about the most important spiritual quality in your life. 
the most important key to your spiritual strength. The greatest key to your relational impact. This key right here will be the secret that will unlock the best physical health you can be in. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work towards your financial potential and it's going to be the key to accomplishing all your goals. You want to know what it is? Oh, no, no, no one wants to know. Okay, all right. I guess we'll move on to a different topic here. Before I tell you what it is, I'm just teasing you a little bit, but before I tell you what it is, I want you to know that this is not based on your appearance, your financial status, your background, your education, or anything like that. It's not these things that are out of your control. What we're going to talk about today, the key to all these areas we just talked about, is, is something that you can unlock in your life. It's, it's something that's available to every single person. Are you ready for it? We're talking about the quality of consistency. Not sexy, is it? You were like, oh, I thought it was me. That would have let down. What a let down. Turn to your neighbor really quick, whoever they are, and just say, it's consistency. <laughs> you may be thinking to yourself now, well, I'm screwed because I'm not very consistent. Uh, most of us, we have areas of inconsistency in our life. You know, we struggle with being consistent with things like eating and exercise. Or maybe you're trying to be good as a follower of Jesus, reading your Bible or praying regularly. Or just showing up to church on time. Like, you struggle with consistency if you're like me. I have struggles. Guys, the struggle is real. Every day of my life, I struggle with consistency. Only thing that I'm probably consistent at all the time at is being inconsistent. That's just, that's probably the best thing here. I, I can relate. As a pastor, I've, I've actually been uh, in church leadership for 20, 22 years, I think, now. And as a person who grew up in a home that we read our Bibles and prayed, and then being on a church staff and being a leader to lead people in spiritual things, I have a confession to make. For years, I struggled with reading my Bible consistently. For years. Like, I'm telling you that it was a good season when I was like 50-50. Like one day on, one day off, for three days on, a week off. Like it was bad. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to be leading people spiritually and I'm struggling with this. It wasn't until maybe five or six years ago that I got a hold on this and got consistent in reading my Bible. And I'm someone who's supposed to be leading people. We all struggle with inconsistency in one area or another. In fact, Paul, the author in scripture, he can relate to this. Look what he says in Romans chapter seven, verse 15. You have to skip down past a couple fill-ins, but Romans chapter seven, you notes, he says this. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. He, he understands the struggle. He's like, what's the deal here? I know the thing I should be doing. And you know, maybe sometimes you get it right, but there's so many other times you're like, why? Why can't I do this right? Like, I can't tell you how many times growing up I wanted to be good at getting up in the morning to read my Bible and, and exercise, and I'd wake up in the morning and before I went to bed, by the way, I was like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And then I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, sleep is so awesome. <laughs> snooze button. And I would snooze like five times. It was 45. It's like, just a little aside, it has nothing to do with the topic. This is just bonus for you today. If you use the snooze button, just want to tell you, you are engaging in a, to a form of torture. <laughs> what is the point of a button that lets you sleep for nine minutes if you fall right back to sleep? What is that? Whoever designed that idea? Here's the thing I learned. Plan when you, your absolute latest, you will get up. The one you're, you're going to snooze to and just set your alarm clock for that and you'll get a whole lot more sleep. You won't have the interrupted five snoozes to get through it. <laughs> this is just help for your, your life, guys. It had nothing to do with, with today's talk, but I'm telling you, we all struggle with this idea of in, inconsistency in our life. And if you know that consistency matters, but you find yourself also being inconsistent, if you're tired of, of having good intentions, but falling short again and again, I've got good news for you. Today is for you. We're, we're titling today's message, The Power of Consistency. And in this series, we've been looking about how to play to win. And if you've followed along the last couple weeks, you know that we've said this, that, that playing to win, if you want to win at the race of life, it largely is in the preparation, not the actual competition that matters. It's not when you face the challenges, it's what you do before you face the challenges. Bear Bryant, the uh, football coach, said this. He said, it is not the will to win that sets winners apart from everybody else. It is the will to prepare to win. You have to prepare to win. We, we, we learned this in this series that 
the direction of our lives is determined largely by the quality of our decisions. And we, we know this, that we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. The problem is most of us are not good at making decisions in the moment. I am a bonehead when it comes to making decisions on the fly. I never, ever, well, like I say never, every once in a while I get it right by accident, but I never make a good decision in the moment when the heat of the moment is on and the emotion is high and I've got like all this pressure. I'm used to making the wrong choices in those situations and you probably understand that too. There was a, a famous football coach who's retired now. His name is Tony Dungy. He, uh, he coached the Tampa Buccaneers and he also, uh, I guess, Go Bucks! And then he also uh, coached in his last part of his career the Indianapolis Colts. He took them to the Super Bowl, became the first African-American coach in 2006 to take a team to the Super Bowl and win. And he retired. But here's the interesting thing. I, I read this in a book that had nothing to do with football about Tony Dungy. Is when he came in to lead the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who were in a mess when he, when he showed up, and he brought them and, and kind of got them to where they, they were when they won the Super Bowl. But he had this unorthodox thing where he came in and he'd work with these players that are professionals. They, they did high school sports, they did college sports at the national level. And now they're professional footballs who've been drafted or paid, paid to play because of how good they are. And he'd bring them all the way back to the basics. And be like, gentlemen, this is a ball. And he would start out with one thing at a time. He'd say, when, when the ball is, is, is hiked, you go here, you do that. If your opponent comes in this way, you go that way. If he comes in this way, you go that way. And if the quarterback, he's, if he's rolling back and he's going for the throw, you do this. Everything had a response. Whatever you see happen here, you react this way. And people thought he was crazy. You know, you, you, gotta, you gotta dive in, get deep into these, these really complicated plays and make sure it's all intricate and you, you fool the other team until all of a sudden, Tony Junji starts winning. And all of a sudden, other people start paying attention. Would you know that today that is a standard practice that they go in and work on the basics with the team? Here's this theory that he had. If you, if you decide that in every situation there's an, a response that's prepared that's the optimum response for that situation, the guys don't have to think, they just react. It's kind of like when you're driving the car on the freeway and all of a sudden the cars in front of you are at a dead stop with their brake lights on. You don't think, oh, let's see, 85 feet on, maybe you'll start applying pressure to the brake. No, 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 no. Your, your, your foot, without even thinking, goes to the brake and you, you lock them up or you push hard to make sure you stop in time that you don't hit the car in front of you. You don't think about it because you already decided in advance what you're going to do if that happens. Sometimes we even get that wrong because there's people who drive with me and I don't know, maybe it's because I've got crazy driving who are sitting in the passenger seat and when I'm supposed to put my brake on, they're pushing the floor where they're at and grabbing this handle up here. I won't tell you the name of it, but they grab the handle and here's the thing. We have these reactions in every situation. Is there any logic to grabbing a handle and pushing your foot to the floor? It don't, I don't think it's going to help you at all. And yet we do that. And, and sometimes in life, we come across a decision we haven't adequately prepared for, and our reaction is not thought through, and it is a quick response, but it's the wrong reaction. But Tony Dungy said if we, if we teach the basics and help people understand that in this situation, you react this way, and every one of those variations, there's a reaction to that. He, he quickens the reaction time, and it's the right response every time. That is what pre-deciding, what we're talking about in the Play to Win series is all about. Preparing for the battle, preparing to win, is about pre-deciding, deciding in advance what you're going to do in, when you're faced with a given situation. We gave you a framework. I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. The framework is this. When faced with blank, when you fill in the situation, when you're faced with this situation, I have pre-decided to take this specific action. In everything you're faced with, things, if you have areas in your life that you come up against all the time, you find yourself going, why did I do that? Why was I not prepared in this situation? That's a good one of those situations to go, hey, this time, I'm going to plan in advance what I'm going to do when I'm faced with that situation in the future. When I'm faced with, with uh, making this financial choice at the car dealership, and it feels good, I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to wait 72 hours. I'm going to ask people who are good at finances, is this a good move? So every situation, you have an, a, a response that's specific that's thought out and prepared for in advance that's not attached to your emotions. Last week we talked, we talked about in this series that for, for three weeks we're going to talk about three really big bucket decisions that if, if you get these ones right and pre-decide in each of these, these three areas, you cover a lot of territory. Last week we talked about being ready when temptation comes. Today we're going to talk about being consistency when you're tempted to not be consistent. Next week we're going to talk about being devoted. And so I, I want to, we've done this each week, I want to do this with you again. I want you guys to say it with me. I am ready, I am consistent, I am devoted. Are you ready? Don't let me down. Here we go. It's just not the same when it's just me, Okay. I am. I am. I am. Okay, the first one everyone had, and then it was like, what's the next one? Okay, ready, consistent, devoted. Here we go. If you're online, shout it out, all caps in the, in the chat. Here we go. Ready? I am. 
I am. I am. That's what we're talking about. And today we're going to dive into this idea of being consistent. But here's the thing I want you to understand when it comes to pre-deciding about your consistency is we don't have the power to do it on our own. We can't be consistent by ourselves. We need God's help. So I'm going to modify the one for today. And I want you guys to say this with me. With God's help, I am consistent. So repeat it after me. With God's help. Okay, I, I, I kind of I muddied the water. So you're going to repeat after me this time. Ready? Here we go. With God's help. I am consistent. Some of you guys are still learning. Here we go. With God's help, I am consistent. You guys got that. Here we go. Let's dive in. Why does consistency matter? In your notes, here's the thing. Successful people, if you want to be a successful person, successful people do consistently what other people only do occasionally. We all do the things that successful people do. We're just not doing them as, as consistently and, and as faithfully as they're doing them. I've, I've been good at exercising at times in my life. In fact, most of my life I've been pretty consistent with that. I've even eaten the right things at some times. But the people who are really good at being healthy with their eating habits, I'm not as good as them because I'm occasional at it. They're consistent at it. There's areas, areas each of us are occasional uh, doers of a certain thing that we should be doing and not consistent in the way we grow to be successful in that area is to do it consistently. consistently. And I want to look today with you guys at a character in scripture um, who perhaps was one of the most consistent leaders of all time. And if you'll turn with me, if you have your Bible, if you want to get online on the, on the Bible tab or if you have the Bible app, get that out. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 6. So get yourself ready and we'll come back to that in just a second. But I want to give you a little context to this story. Uh, the book of Daniel sets up what happens is the nation of Israel, uh, years before this time, was divided in two kingdoms. We had the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. The, the northern kingdom had already been conquered by the Assyrians and they had been defeated deported. And now the, the southern kingdom, with the capital of Jerusalem, is being besieged by Babylon. The Babylonians besiege them for a number of months. Finally, the city is conquered, and they take all of the people that are of value, of, of, of status in the city, and they deport them out. And Daniel, who this, who's the author of Daniel, and one who's the main character of the story, is deported with the first group of about 3,000 of these guys out of Jerusalem. And what the enemy did was they took the best and the brightest, because they wanted to, to indoctrinate them by giving them the, the Babylonian food by teaching them Babylonian education and by getting them to follow Babylonian values. They basically wanted to brainwash them, indoctrinate them so they could now use them and their skill sets, but use them for the Babylonian kingdom. It was kind of a slap in the face of the, of the area they conquered to take their best and brightest and turn them against them. So the, the, they, they turn these guys away and, and now Fast forward, Daniel was one of those men who actually did not, he withstood the indoctrination because of his consistency and his devotion to God. And here we are now, three kings later, there's King Darius who's now in charge. King Darius loves Daniel, and he's got Daniel in charge of a lot of stuff. And as we read, in fact, I want to read with you the beginning of chapter 6, what Darius does. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, big, vast kingdom. And he appointed a high officer to rule each, uh, over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. And therein lies the problem. Because these other high officers, these other administrators, they want power and they're jealous because Daniel is not going to be put over everything and they don't like this at all. They want to, to come in and sabotage this plan. And here's the thing, they, in, the, in their, their quest to try and, and get Daniel kind of smeared in the mud, it kind of be the modern day equivalent of like trying to find, you know, if Daniel was a government official, trying to find like some, you know, derogatory thing he said on, on social media, you know, a number of years ago that you could pull up and throw in his face, or you find that he's paid off the nanny to, to you know, run away quietly, that that wasn't his baby, that kind of thing. They're looking for the dirt, okay, because they want to cancel him. But here's the problem. They can't find any. If you look at uh, verse 4 in your notes, this will be on the screen and in your notes, this is what happens. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to crit criticize or condemn. Get this. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. I want you to underline those three qualities. He was faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. 
Those three qualities are evidence of Daniel's amazing consistency. You can't be faithful without having consistency in your life. People will not see you as a faithful person if you're not consistent. Being always responsible. When there's people in my life who are responsible, they're the people I can trust because they're consistently responsible in every area of their life. And then, of course, completely trustworthy. You put your trust in people who show up and do the right thing every time consistently. This, these are all three evidences of Daniel's amazing consistency. So since they couldn't find any dirt on Daniel, get this, they decided to use his consistency against him. How cool is that? Daniel is so cool in his character that they have to take one of his strengths to use against him. And they're so sure that it's going to work, they actually take Daniel's consistency and, and, and decide that they can use that as a viable strategy to get him deceited from his position of authority. Because they can rely on how... He's so consistent, they can rely on his consistency to get him fired. And so they go to the king... They go to the king and they tell him, Oh, king, you're the goat. You're the greatest of all time. You're, no one is better than you. What do you think of this great idea we have, king, that for the next 30 days, anyone who bows, or bows down or prays to anyone, human or God, other than you, they get thrown in the lion's den. The king's like, well, thank you for saying I'm the goat. I, I agree with you. I am awesome. I'm pretty cool. And I love what you have to say. Let's do it. They talk, they kind of conned him into to putting this rule into action. And what was true of the laws in Babylon at that time is that a law, even the king could not undo a law that he had decreed. So he put this law into action, this strategy against him. And I thought it was interesting that they just said 30 days. They were so sure of Daniel's consistency. They didn't say forever or a year. They said 30 days. Now, if I was Daniel and, and I was in issues, let's just pretend like the President of the United States just said, for the next 30 days, I'm not allowed to pray in public or I'll be thrown in prison for life. We don't, we don't do the death penalty that often here, but I'm going to be thrown in prison for my, my whole life if I pray in public. I'm caught praying in public for the next 30 days. What do I do? Well, that's easy. I'll pray in private. No one will see me. They won't see what's going on. What does Daniel do in verse 10 when he learns of the, the, the law? It says, Daniel learned that the law had been signed. He went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done. Underline that phrase, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. If you don't know the story, you may think to yourself, wow, how bold, you know, he stood for his, what he believed in a lot. I'm sure things worked out good for him. No, not really. If you ever heard the story about Daniel and the lion's den, there's a reason why they call it and the lion's den. Because Daniel, much to the way the king didn't want to do it, but he was now forced to put Daniel in the lion's den. In fact, in fact, Daniel says that he spent an entire day trying to figure out how to get out of this, but he couldn't. And so Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den. The king can't sleep all night. He goes back to the lion's den in the morning and he gets the stone pulled away and he says, Daniel, are you alive? Much to his, his great surprise, Daniel hollers back, yes, I haven't been harmed. The, the angel of God shut the lion's mouths. And, and so the king, so enraged at these other guys, he throws all of them in. And just so you don't think the lions just weren't hungry or Daniel wasn't tasty enough, all the rest of them got devoured pretty quickly. Pretty gruesome story there. I want to read to you in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 23. The results was this. The king was overjoyed in order that Daniel be lifted from the den and not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. That's the model of consistency we want to look at today. Where did Daniel learn to trust God? Where did he learn that from? It was not in the lion's den. It was in his prayer closet, that daily three times a day prayer that he did. That's where he learned consistency. It, his faith was not, was, was not built in the battle. His faith was built on his knees. We just sung this song a little bit ago. The battle belongs that when I, when I fight, I will fight on my knees. Do you understand the, the imagery there? I will get down on my knees and pray. That is where the fight is won. God fights my battles for me. Daniel understood this, not from the battle, but from the time he spent on his knees in prayer. It's not what we do occasionally that makes the difference. It's what we do consistency. So how do we grow in this area of consistency? I want to offer you three things this morning in your notes. The first one is this. Number one, start with why. Start with the why. What was Daniel's why? in this story. Well, Daniel was devoted to God. That was his motivation. Do you know there's a reason I believe that most New Year's Eve resolutions fail within the first month, a lot of them sometimes within the first week? It's this, it's because we are building New Year's re resolutions on desire rather than devotion. We, we see something that someone else did, we're like, oh, I want that. I want to do that. Oh, that looks cool. I want to be like that. Oh, I want to look like that too. Oh, I can if I suck it in. You know, and we, we have all these things we want and we desire but they're not, they're not based and birthed out of our devotion. 
If you don't have a compelling why, you are not likely to succeed. Jesus had a compelling why in the New Testament, why he came to the earth and what he did for us. John chapter 10 and verse 10, you notice this is John recording the Good Shepherd chapters as it's known. He says, this is Jesus speaking, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Satan's job and all his amb ambition and his passion is to steal, kill, and destroy anything that's valuable to God. But Jesus says, in contrast, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus said, I came to give a rich and satisfying life to each and every one who would call me their own. And here's the thing. Verse 11 in your notes, if you read this with me, it says this, I, he, this. Jesus goes on in the next verse. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus sees who he is. He says, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. I'll bet you most readers or most listeners at that time, when he said those words, did not understand that he was being prophetic in that moment because he eventually one day sacrificed his life for his sheep. He sacrificed his life so that we could have a rich and satisfying life. He was so resolved on what he wanted to do, what he was called to do, and consistent in that process, the path all the way to his death on the cross, that he went without wavering, without question. Was there anguish? Yes. Was it hard? Yes. But he never wavered in his mind because he knew that was what he was here, what he was called to do. And he was consistent because he knew what his why was. If you want to make a lasting commitment to consistency, you need to understand your why in any decision. If you want to get healthy, why? Why do you want to get healthy? If you want to get out of debt, why is that? If you want to get closer to God, why? Is it because your pastor told you to? Is it because it seems like a good thing? That's not a strong enough why. Maybe it should be this. I want to get closer to God because I understand that God has the power to transform my life. And I believe the power of the gospel can transform others' lives. And the closer I get to him and the more devoted I am to living my life for him, then I can change and impact other people's lives like mine has been impacted. That's a pretty compelling why. How about this? You want, to, you want to have a better marriage? Why? Because this deadbeat over here, you know, I, you know like I just want to get a better, better relationship with them? Or No, no, it's not about that. Oh, God, fix them. Pray for me, Pastor. It's not that. What's your compelling why? Maybe it's this, because I want to honor the vows that I made before God at the altar on my wedding day. Maybe it's that I want, I want to show my kids that one day as they grow up what a loving relationship looks like, and I'm dedicated to that as best as I can. Maybe it's that one day I pass a legacy to my grandkids of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be faithful in that relationship. I want to have financial stability. Why? So you can buy that purse or that diamond ring. You can get that car, that sports car you always wanted. It's not a very compelling why. What about this? What if it was this? I am tired of living paycheck to paycheck and wondering which bill I'm going to pay because if I pay this one, this one doesn't get paid. I'm tired of the stress of that lifestyle and I want the freedom to know that in every situation my finances are in good, in good shape and I have the freedom to be generous, that I can give away, that I can do things for other people when the opportunity arises because I have margin in my finances and I know I can impact people's lives because money is a tool that can be effective in that way. You have, you have to have a compelling why for every situation. Your why moves you from desire to devotion. It's not willpower that makes consistency possible. It's why power. If you heard that statement, where there's a will, there's a way, I think it's better said where there's a why, there's a way. In your notes, when you know your why, you will find a way. I promise you that. Number two, plan to fail. If I want to grow in consistency, I need to plan to fail. And you're like, what? You're, you're telling me just set myself up for failure from the beginning? No, what I'm telling you is this, we are imperfect people, we make mistakes, and you need to be aware of that, that you may set on a, a course to be consistent with your finances and maybe paying off debt. You may be you know, set on a course to be consistent with your, your love with your spouse, and yet there's, there's those hiccups that happen, arguments that take place, or those situations where you have a little bit of a fallout. You need a plan to fail because we are not perfect people. And, and sometimes I think one of the, the things that happens in Scripture is that we look at, at people like Daniel and we over-spiritualize those characters in, in the Bible because we don't get to see the granular details of what happened in their everyday life. Do you think that Daniel ever failed in his commitments to God, in his consistency? Absolutely. Maybe we don't read about it in Scripture because there's not enough detail, but he absolutely did. He was not perfect. If he was perfect, he would have been Jesus. He wasn't. He was Daniel. And we all have things that we struggle with. You think about the person you look, look to and admire the most and in their consistency and ask them, did you ever struggle with consistency in any area of your life? I promise you the answer is yes. We have to plan to fail. Understand that failure is part of the process. 
Look what Jesus, or what, uh, yeah, Jesus said to, to Paul. These are the words of Paul recorded in 2 Corinthians. Jesus said this to Paul, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Then Paul's response is this, So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of God, or power of Christ can work through me. See, Paul recognized I have weaknesses and it's in my weaknesses that I'm made strong by Jesus and what he can do in my life. He's the one who strengthens me. And a lot of times I think we feel like if we're going to be successful in anything in life, we got to be perfect. We've got to do it just right. The truth of the matter is this, that we all make mistakes. We, we have failures. We have lapses in judgment, things that go on in our life. What we do is we learn from them. That's the process. In your notes, being consistent is not the same thing as being perfect. See, if you mess up, don't try to make it up. Like, for instance, let's say you wanted to do uh, like a two-mile run every day to get more healthy, and you miss a day. Don't try to do four the next day to make up for it. Just jump back on and do the two. And also don't go, well, I missed today, so I guess I'm done. Don't throw in the towel. Stick with it. So what if you missed today? Jump back up the next available opportunity and do the thing that you plan to do. Don't, every day wipe the slate clean. Start with a clean slate. Don't keep letting it accumulate because then it just gets harder and harder and overwhelming and eventually you're just like, what's the point? I can't do that. If I'm inconsistent, or if I'm consistent, I will make progress. Instead, what happens is we fall in love with the, 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 the process of, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself there. Instead, what happens is that the momentary failure is, is something that causes us to give up. Instead, we need to understand that that momentary failure is actually part of the process of becoming more and more consistent. The illusion of perfection keeps some of us from getting started in the first place. I heard someone say recently that they're into jujitsu. And, the, you know, the, in all martial arts, there's like belts. And he was talking about the white belt is the first one. And as you go through the process, you know, the highest one is the black belt. I don't know enough to know all the different colors in between. But I do know this, that, that his master came up to him one day and was awarding him a new stripe on his belt. And he said to him, he said, do you know what the hardest belt is to get in jujitsu? And he said, well, obviously the black belt. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's the white belt. Because most people don't even get started. Most people can't make it past. They'll come, they'll try it out, and they're out. If you get past the first belt, the white belt, you are more likely than anybody else to stay in the game all the way to black belt. And he said also, he said, he said to him, he said, what do you think a black belt is? He's like, that's someone you run from. And he's like, no, no, no. Here's a black belt. A black belt is a white belt who didn't give up. In our lives, there's areas of our lives that we just keep going. He said, you know, I've failed many times in jiu-jitsu where I got sore, I was tired or too busy, and I didn't show up the, to my training. I didn't go when I was supposed to. I kind of fell off, and then I had to get back on again because I'm learning that the consistency is built up over time. And if you want to get good at something, you want to succeed in an area, you have to be consistent and realize that failure is part of that process. Don't obsess about it. The, the, the thing is that, that uh, we get stuck up and hung up on this idea of being perfect or if I mess up, I'm a failure. No, you're not a failure. You're a, a person who's succeeding who happened to fail in that moment. Here's the third part of being consistent and that is this, fall in love with the process. Fall in love with the process. Daniel had a deep love for God. Daniel was not like devoted to God because he was hoping to get promoted by the king. It wasn't, hey, be devoted, get promoted. That was not his slogan. Daniel was devoted to God because he had a love affair with God. He loved spending time with God. He was devoted to God because of the relationship he had with God. All the other stuff was a byproduct of that. His success in working for kings and all that he was awarded was a result of his consistency with his God. It wasn't the, the, the goal he was aiming for. It was just the, the reality of what happened because he was devoted to God. He, he lived his life consistently in a way that honored God. In, in uh, Romans, Paul writes these words about consistency. We can rejoice too when we, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Pause there. Paul's explaining the process of consistency in our lives. We will face trials. Those trials will be tough. Sometimes we won't actually be able to be strong enough to meet that trial and that challenge that comes our way. We'll fail at it. Sometimes it'll be so hard we wish it never came again. But that is the process. And then he goes on to say, that endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. That's the result of this consistency compounded. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, he says. See, there's a process if we want to become consistent. In your notes, no matter what happens, no experience is wasted. When you're on the journey and you fail, that failure is only wasted if you don't learn from it or if you let it keep you down. 
If you brush yourself up, get back up and go again, that failure will make you stronger. Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is a companion to success. If you're on the journey and you face a trial and it's so difficult you don't know if you could ever withstand that again, that's part of the process. That's how we grow. Nothing that we face in our life, whether we fail or we learn from it, will ever go to waste as long as we keep moving forward. The mistake is that we obsess about the goal and instead what we should be doing is falling in love with the process. If you want to be dedicated and devoted to God, Fall in love with the process of that, the day-to-day, not the end goal. You aren't, you aren't successful when you achieve your goal in the future. You're successful when you honor God today. You will learn in every area of your life, this is true. We have goals that motivate us, things that we want to go for. I, I want to save up money for this vacation. I want to work really hard on my physical health to get to this point in our life. We have these goals we aim for, and there's nothing wrong with those. I'm not poo-pooing goals at all. But I'm telling you this, the goal is, is great, but what you become in the process of reaching that goal is greater. It's the process that where, the, where the secret is found in our success. That's where we become stronger. So repeat this with me again, with God's help. With God's help. Try it again. With God's help, with God's help. I, am I am consistent. One more time. With God's help, with God's help. I am consistent. We can't do it on our own. Even Paul knew that. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, we opened up with this passage where Paul's like, I don't understand the thing I, I don't want to do. I end up doing the thing I, don't, I know I shouldn't do. I end up doing that. I, I'm a messed up guy. He says this in Romans chapter 7, in, in verse 23. He says, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Then he goes on to say, he goes, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? It's like, I understand the struggle is real. He understands also he can't do it on his own because his answer, he answers his own question in verse 25 when he says this, thank God, the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. With God's help, I am consistent. With God's help, I am getting healthier physically. With God's help, my marriage is getting stronger every day. With God's help, and this, the help of the school, because they're getting school now, I am going to become a better parent for my children and, and raise them well. With God's help, I'm going to do a better job of reading his word daily and praying and making sure my relationship is developing with him. With, with God's help, I am going to be consistent. Here's a consistency. consistency th- can't say consistency. There it is. Maybe that's what I need to get consistent at. Saying consistency 10 times fast. With God's help, I'm going to get consistent at showing up to church every week that I can. Because it's here where you learn the principles and you learn how to grow and become, follow the way and become closer to God and who he wants you to be. And it is here that you develop relationships and, and get into community with people that you do life together with. But whatever it is, with God's help, I will, and you, you fill in the blank, what is it that area that you want to get consistent in? In your notes, there's, at the bottom, there's a next step, number two, I will pre-decide to be consistent with. What is that area right now that comes to mind that you want to be, be consistent with? Maybe you don't know the answer. Ask God, where do you want me to be consistent, God? What is an area that you would point out to me, God? And he will show you. God will show you something that that goes with his values. And when you know what God's values are, they become your values. And we learn in this series that when our values are clearer, our decisions become easier. So if you need help, ask God, God, what area do you want me to grow in my consistency this week? I want you guys to go out this week with a, with a new mindset. These, this is an area probably, we, we talked about in the beginning, that probably can revolutionize just about every area of your life if you can grow in it. It's about discipline. It's about faithfulness. It's about showing up every time no matter what. But here's the thing. I taught you the potty training principle two weeks ago. If you remember, you heard that. But here's the thing. Until you, until you are ready to in the moment right now to decide that when you're faced with this obstacle or this thing that you're trying to get good at and be consistent at and you're going to do it no matter what you're faced to the level that you right now you guys who have to go to the bathroom are not going to go in your pants you're going to find the bathroom because you've predecided you won't do that once you've decided at that level all of a sudden the decision becomes easier it will not be easier to live it out but it'll be easier to manage that decision and that that will help you grow in this area of consistency in your life would you pray with me? God, this morning as we wrap up and we, we talk about this idea of consistency, man, you are the one who has been more consistent than anybody else in the history of time. You are divine. You are God. 
in everything you ever said you would do, you have done. You have always been faithful. You are reliable. You are trustworthy. God, help us to gain strength from from your consistency. God, let us borrow some of your consistency in our lives today, in the areas that we identify for ourselves that we need to grow in so that we can go out from this day forward and be consistent in those areas, to find victory in them, that we be known like Daniel as a person of reputation of being faithful and responsible and trustworthy. God, help us to begin that today. We know the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Help us to take those baby steps even today. We thank you. We love you. And in your name we pray. Amen.